Josh McPherson, you are here. <coughs> You're coughing. <laughs> <laughs> and we're ready to start the show. No, no, we, we've done too many. We've started the show. We've screwed up. There are only a few people I really look up to and want to emulate in life. John Lovell is one of those men. When he posted this interview with Josh McPherson, I absolutely had to talk about it with you. Let's hit the highlights of this amazing interview and dive deeper onto some of the key points. Here we go. Yeah. Years and years ago, yeah. I was reading an Eldridge book, Wild at Heart, you yes. know, the classic work. Yep. He said this, uh, some, in something to the effect of, every man has a wound, and that wound is inflicted by his father. Mm -hmm. was, was Eldridge being reckless when he made that statement? No, he was being prophetic. He was being absolutely prophetic wow. in the sense that um, the most important person in every person's life is their dad. Well, what a way to start. Um, I definitely couldn't agree with that more. You know, my father was the most important mentor to me in the world. There's a difference between a role model and a mentor. And I really think that you only have, if you're lucky, two, maybe three mentors in your entire life. The people that you seek out to really gain profound wisdom from, my father was absolutely one of those. He was my hero growing up. We did so much together. I learned a lot from him. And you talk about the father wound you carry. It's both a good and a bad thing. And when my father um, was about 62 years old and I was just getting into my career in the fire service, he reached out to me and said, hey, I've got cancer. It's a pretty bad form of it. I'm gonna fight it. I'm gonna fight it the best I can. At this point, I had already had one kiddo, Bromley, who was our first kiddo, but we were pregnant and we had our second kid, Callan, coming on the way. So when we were getting through the process of, all right, the due date is August 30th. Can my dad make it that long? The one question that he always asked whenever he could was how much longer do we have until Callan comes? He would ask that, I would say the amount of days, he would sit back and you could tell he would focus in his mind, all right, four more days, I have to last four more days so I can see my second grandchild. And he was able to last until he was born and we got out of the hospital early so that we could take Callan as a baby, new baby boy, to go and see Grandpa Thaddeus before he passed away. And he passed as soon as he saw him, about a day later. It was absolutely horrible, but that's the father wound that now I carry as a result of that. My father, who gave me the values that I espouse and that I hold, will not be able to provide and show those values to his grandchildren, um, and I won't have to be able to learn as much from him now that he's gone. So it's such a sad thing. So as you're watching this and going through and learning these lessons that we are going to talk about together, keep that in mind. Life is so damn short. And if you can take it, seize it by the horns, and really jump in with your father, whether it's a good or a bad relationship, renew that relationship. Tell him that it, it was not your fault. Um, or that you appreciate him and the things that he did for you and your family or your brothers and sisters, it will go a long way to help when he is on his deathbed to really improve. But that's a downer way to start it. Let's keep going. Let's see what else he has to say. The person that gave you your emotional framework mm -hmm. and your worldview reference point was your dad. Children were made with a need to be affirmed by a father. Oh. That's just built into the, into the DNA of every human being. And when, when the absence of that affirmation exists, they're gonna to look to have that affirmation filled with something or someone else. And the problem is where they look to have that affirmation met is oftentimes in things that are destructive. Yeah, having that affirmation, you know, I see it in my two boys. I've got three kids. I've got a girl who is three years old, a boy who is now six, and then another boy, Bromley, who is nine years old. He is so much fun. Both of those boys are so much fun. But I can tell, especially as we interact between their mother, my wife, Alex, and me, there's just a difference. There's a nuance to how we interact together. And they want that affirmation, even in the smallest things. When we're at the pool and they're yelling out, look at me, look at me, I want, to see, I want you to see me, Daddy. Those are the kind of things where if you take the time to affirm, acknowledge, and appreciate what they're doing, it will go far beyond from their both self-esteem and their ability to know that they're doing the right thing because they know that their father appreciates what they're doing. Such a cool thought, such a cool way to think about it. Let's keep going. Is um, because I think the problem is we have an absent 
of absence of strong men in our culture. Right. So what and our society is dying from it. It's the like abs- number one cause of death, lack of masculinity. A hundred percent. Strong masculinity. A hundred percent. So in the absence of strong masculinity, society craters. Yeah. So I think the number one solution to all of the social ills that we have is for the rise of strong men, no, mm-hmm. not not abusive men, strong men. Yeah. Strong men, mean, it means you're dangerous, but you're under control. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they have such a good point. And if you're watching this video now and you know of John Lovell, we're probably aligned from that perspective of there is an infeminent um, push in society today for boys and men to not be masculine, to not provide for their family, and to not show that outward physical um, appearance and support. And that is a big, big problem. If we allow our boys and our men to be feminized and effeminate, they will grow up to not provide and fulfill the role that they have and that they are required to have in the world. You know, just the other day, I was reading this book, specifically The Warrior Poet, listening to John Lovell specifically talk about how you want to cultivate the inner man that is in your little boy. If you have a little boy, take the time, take the opportunity to roughhouse with him, take the opportunity to let him attack you. When we were at the pool just the other day, we love heading across the street, we hang out at the pool all the time, and oftentimes I don't necessarily want them to try to push me in the water or things like that. But yesterday after reading this book, I really decided, all right, you know what? I'm going to try to entice some more of this boyhood vigor and a little bit of masculinity out of my kids and I'm going to allow them to really work hard to try to get me in the water and push me in. So I egged them on a little bit. I made sure that they were working as hard as they could and you could see my little kiddo, Callan, my six-year-old, would just go full bar all the time. Push as hard as he can to try to push me in the water while the older kid is now starting to think, all right, Physical strength is good, but how can I be more cunning? How can we get to him when he's not ready for it? So the two of them watching them work together like little warriors to see how they could push their dad in the water was so much fun to see, so much fun to be a part of, and it's helping to plant those seeds of masculinity so that they can sow them when they move forward and they are raising a family of their own. So it was such a fun thing to be a part of. Let's jump back in. Because your son's gonna wanna follow you, be like you, look like you, sound like you. And if you're not worth looking like, sounding like, and following, (laughs) then you have no starting point or starting place or reference point to be a good dad. So the first step in being a good dad is to be a good man. Yeah, I mean, obviously, so important. Um, You and I have so much that we deal with on a daily basis, right? We probably are providing for our family, either solely or in a large part. Um, We want to make sure that the house is in order have the cars running. We want to support our wife as much as humanly possible. We wanna do all of these things. Oftentimes we forget to be a man when we're in the moment of these things. I know I fall for it all the time. I've got a whole bunch of work and a whole bunch of calls to be on for the day for work. I don't feel like getting up and working out and exercising. I don't feel like getting up and supporting my wife when it's lunchtime and I can hear them upstairs and my wife screaming because things are challenging for her. Step up. Be that man, support your wife first, and then make sure your kids can see that so they know that there are different roles in the household. The wife is providing for the children while you are providing for your wife, and that will really help. So being that man and showcasing that is such a huge need and a huge opportunity for everybody to jump back into. Let's keep going. I think um, every dad is probably doing the best he can do with what he had to work with. And so broken people break things, hurt people hurt people. Yeah. And so, um, and that, 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 that's the long tail of a broken man. Right. Is, is that the people underneath him are going to be broken and they'll in turn break things. Yeah, you know, he has such a good point during this whole part is if you grew up in a family or had a father or an absent father and you didn't have the support that you wanted, you could be that broken person breaking things or a hurt person that are hurting people, but you can rise above that and you can help to facilitate a change in that approach by just simply acknowledging where you sit today, acknowledging the hand you've been dealt and knowing that you have the capability to change that and move forward and make a better life for your son or for your daughter. Such a cool point. In order to be a good dad, you have to have had a good dad. Mm. And if you didn't have a good earthly father, I would say as a pastor, there's a heavenly father you can tap into uh, and learn good. from that's good. and draw from, right? And yeah. that, he- that heavenly father can then heal some of the wounds of, of the earthly father. But to- I have a confession to make. 
no pun intended, I have not and had not set foot in a church for a mass or for a service until the age of 42. I went for Easter service, I take it back, we went for Christmas service just this last year in 2023 with friends. We have some very close friends um, that we set up as a guy group, which I'll have another video about. And they've been subtly prodding and pushing for me to join them at church. For whatever reason, I just never thought that I really needed to go to church. I, my, my family, my parents never went to church and they always just said, listen, Church is a good thing for people that need morals, but we have good morals as a family, so we don't necessarily go to church. And that's how I always thought about, um, you know, either the Catholic, Christian, um, religion in general. I don't need to go there because I feel like a good moral person, and I still know that I'm a good moral person. When I set foot in that church, I was extremely nervous. I hate singing. I really don't like clapping along to music, and the church that we go to is absolutely fantastic, Timberline Church here in Fort Collins, Colorado. And every Sunday when they start that service, they play three songs really loud, um, everybody sings along with it, and I'm so nervous, I'm so uncomfortable sitting there, standing there, and, and getting ready for that. But I love going to church now every single Sunday because when that music stops playing and those incredible singers finish playing, we get these sermons every single Sunday from different pastors every single time that provide this wisdom and this guidance that is from the Bible that tells the life of Jesus that are things that you just simply don't think about on a daily basis. Things that reference you, that bring you to a foundational level, that help to ground you to be able to make better decisions and become a better person and live more like Jesus going forward. So. By sheer fact of me going to church now, I feel like I'm improving as a person, as a husband, as a father every single day as a result of that. If you don't go to church, I don't necessarily blame you, but it's something to absolutely think about. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts. Put them in the comments below. Have you been to church? Do you go to church? Are you resonant to going? Put them in the comments, let's have that discussion because I sure was in your shoes not long ago and I am definitely converted and I'm learning every single time I go. So church is absolutely huge from my perspective. But my, in my experience, the most successful men I've been around are the most wounded. Yeah. Like they're being, like, like, like they're being driven by a dad who walked out and kicked over the wood pile and said, try again and walked off. Meaning? Because they didn't stack the wood pile like their dad wanted and bro, they've been trying to get the wood pile right for the last 40 years. Such an interesting point, right? Um, I don't know that I necessarily feel that. I know my father was very driven. He always focused on what he called the big E, effort. Put effort into everything that you do. And I really try to showcase and emulate that as I move forward. So that's a big thing. But you look at the Elon Musks of the world, um, the um, really super rich, super powerful people, they all had unique upbringings and that helps to drive them. Now, whether that's a good or a bad thing, that is the story, that is the ethos that forms them, and then they are moving that forward. The question now is what do you take, what have you learned from that ethos from growing up, and how are you going to channel the good things to your current kids or kid and not use the things that were the bad things, take that knowledge and move forward? It's a really interesting point. See, a lot of people would look at it, look you like hustle culture particularly would mm -hmm. look at that and be like no you got to get out and earn you push work harder than everybody else and crush and like yeah. and usually hustle it's, culture is stupid yeah i hate hustle culture because it destroys men while uh, making them think that they're growing a hundred percent here's here's the litmus test for manhood um if you're succeeding most at the easiest things i have no respect for you what's the easiest things working out three hours a day yeah that is and it's pure vanity too yeah, hustle culture, that's, that's quite the big uh, bugaboo as we look around our culture today. There's really two camps, right? There's kind of the Andrew Tates of the world. You gotta hustle, you gotta push, you gotta get women, you gotta do all of these different things. And then there's this growing appreciation for working hard at one thing, whether it's your job, whether it's me doing this YouTube channel to connect with you, if you can focus on one thing, do it right, do it well, focus on your children, focus on your wife, and make sure that you're doing that correctly and to the best of your ability, 
the hustle culture side of it won't be necessary because you're going to be doing the right things for the right reasons and you're going to succeed both financially from a health perspective and otherwise so that you can really move forward with life. So yeah, hustle culture, we can definitely have more conversations about that, but I agree that is not the way to go. And if you work out more than you focus on your kids, that's a pretty profound problem. If you as a man succeed at the easiest things, I don't, I don't, have, I don't necessarily respect you. Easiest things, abs, money, power, position. Like you can get those things. The yeah. hard things, can you win a woman? And yeah. can you keep her one for a lifetime? Talk a weak-willed and emotionally vulnerable girl into sleeping with you one time. That, yeah. That's not hard at all. Yeah. Anybody can take advantage of a woman. Win a woman and keep her one for a lifetime. You know, um, I'm, another guy that I watch quite a bit is uh, Nick Friedis. Nick Friedis, what's his name? Put in the comments below. Um, he is another guy. Uh, he was in the military. He talks a lot um, on um, YouTube. He's got a podcast as well. But he has this great quote when he was talking about when he was getting ready to have a daughter. He was thinking, all right, what are, do I need to do? What do I need to learn about with my daughter that's coming into the world? So he talked to his wife. And then he went out and he found his close friend from the military who was the biggest player that he had ever known. And he asked him, what do I need to do to have a daughter who will not sleep with someone like you? And that man told Nick, you need to tell her you love her because when you tell her you love her, she won't fall for me telling her the same. Girls, especially that don't have an appreciation for um, love, will fall for any man that comes up and actually shows that true amount of affection, even if it is an Andrew Tate of the world that is doing that, right? It takes a man to win a noble woman and then keep her one for a lifetime. That's great. Like that, that's hard. If you can win a woman, keep her one for a lifetime by emulating that love and showcasing that love for your wife, your daughter is going to see this is how a man should treat a woman. And when that little boy that's trying to be um, uh, taking advantage of your daughter comes around, she'll say, no, this isn't the right guy, right? So what are the ways can you win over your wife day after day? You know, when um, my wife and I were married but without kids, um, I would go through these phases. There were about six weeks at a time where, you know, I would work really hard. Um, I would try to keep the house in order, um, cooking her dinner in the evenings. Um, but I would start to slowly let things slip and it would kind of pile up, right? So um, I wouldn't do as much for her. Um, I, I would not work as hard. I wouldn't support her as much. And finally, I got to this point where she would blow up at me. She would scream at me. We'd have this big falling out and fight. I'd go back down to rock bottom, I would apologize, I would do all the things that she had asked me to do and then that would start back up again, right? And we would be on these revolving systems. So I finally started to realize, listen Ryan, don't go around this process on this cyclical cycle. Try to do the small steps every single day to keep us in a relationship at this high level so that I can continue to keep her one and not let her just hope that I uh, rise to her level and to her expectation every single day. So working on that was a big deal for me. And then when we had kids, having kids, you're just in survival mode at the first, you know, two, three, four, five months, right? You're doing what you can to help your wife out. If she's nursing, you're doing everything you can to support. But as your kids get past that second year, that's where you move from being the mother's aid to now being a co-parent and you're helping to facilitate that. And it's really careful. You gotta be careful not to fall into the fact that, all right, my wife is the one that's doing all of the mom things and I'm just the one that's there to come and play with the kids and help out with the kids. And you're going to keep that mom's aid going for the rest of your life um, while the kids are in the house. Don't do that. Focus on being a husband and a wife first support her, come and give her a hug in the morning, ask her how she slept, ask her how her day was at the end of the day. Focus on her and your kids will naturally see that and they will improve and they will follow suit. Focus on that marriage first, keep her one for a lifetime and everything else will pay dividends and bear fruit as you move forward from that point down. Yeah. Uh, it takes a man to be emotionally present so that his children feel loved? Because here's the question um, I'll ask kids all the time. Does your dad love you? And they'll go, yeah. And then I'll ask a second question. And this is a very different question. Do you feel loved? And eight out of, eight out of 10 times they'll go, 
Well, not really, but I know he loves me. Wow. There's a wild difference between a child intellectually knowing you love them or them telling themselves you love them because they want to think you love them and them feeling loved. And therein lies the challenge of a man. And so when I talk to husbands and wives in a counseling scenario, um, the wife will, will <clears throat> be talking about their things. And I'll ask her, I said, do you feel loved by your husband? And she'll say, well, no. And he'll say, well, that's not fair. I said, bro, that's the whole game. Yeah. Your job is to live in such a way as to make her feel loved. So the simple question that I ask my wife all the time that most men have never asked their wife is, what do I do to make you feel loved? Boy, so much to unpack there, but it's such a good point. And we kind of talked about it, right? Showing your wife that you love her, it can be so difficult, especially when you move into, you know, four, five, seven, ten 10 years of marriage, you have kids onto it, you're in survival mode. So how can you show your wife that you love her and ask her how she feels loved. Just the other day, you know, my wife had a really rough day. She's driving home from work. She's ranting to me. And I've been doing enough of this work to try to become a better father and a better husband to know to shut the heck up, Ryan. Let her rant. Let her get this off her chest. Actively listen to this. But there were little points in this rant of hers where she was snipping at me and the things that I didn't do throughout the day. And it started to grind on me a little bit. And I was thinking about it in my head. I was present in the moment thinking, don't let this get to you. And it was so difficult for me to not want to be defensive and um, and basically jump back with a defensive talk. And I, I tried to resist, but I didn't. Um, and it, it didn't go well, right? Um, so the things that I need to do to be able to show her that I love her is be present in the moment where I know that I should not say this thing. And when I do, apologize to her right away as soon as she walks in from work and let her know that, hey, I'm sorry about this. I know you've had a rough day. What can I do to help you? And I'm going to start asking that question. What can I do to make you feel loved? So she can tell me. We can continue to have that open conversation. It will really help out as we move forward and continue to try to improve upon and have this great relationship that we have. What wounds am I accidentally giving my sons? Mm -hmm. There are um, absent dads who just aren't present physically or emotionally or spiritually. So there's some dads that aren't present because they've left or they're too busy at work. There's some dads who are home but on their phone. Mm. So they're not present emotionally, which is almost worse. If you're not there physically, at least you're not there. Yeah. But when you're there but not there, when you're in the room but not present, you're telling the kid, what I'm looking at on this screen, whatever it happens to be, is more important than you. I struggle with this all the time. You know, I work from home at my day job. Um, so oftentimes I'm on calls while I'm upstairs as the kids are getting ready for breakfast. And I do my best when I'm on those calls to sit down, I get close to their level, and I tell them, listen, I'm on a call. I can't talk right now. Please understand that. And they're usually pretty good about that. But oftentimes, you know, I'm really bad about this. I'm always trying to learn, right? So I, I have, from Craig, frankly, right now, I'm listening to Warrior Poet Society, John Lovell's book. Highly recommend it. But I'm listening to that while I'm cooking dinner or while I am engaging and cleaning up and doing things around the house. And oftentimes, my kids are screaming from the other room, hey, daddy, come look at this. Hey, daddy, look at this. They know that I am ignoring them and they know that I have that earbud in my ear. So I try all the time to acknowledge them, stop what I'm doing, take that out of my ear, get down to their level and really get face to face with them so that they know they can have that affirmation that we talked about earlier. And just as importantly, so we can have that conversation and they know that this phone is not as important as they are. That's such a challenge. I work on it all the time. I need to get better. And I am curious how you do it. If you have any tips, let me know because I'm still working on that. But it really is an important point. Most men have a better plan for their fitness and their diet than they have for their sons. Oh, that's awful. And that drives, that, that's that drives me nuts. What a warped priority system. Yeah. And, so, and, and the kids feel that. And when the kids watch dad rattle off facts about his fake football team he's got on his phone or laughing at endless scrolling and YouTube videos, but never turn and ask him about their day or ask him how they're doing, they intuitively know that whatever he's doing out there is infinitely more important than me because we give our time to what we think is most important. Yeah, yeah if your son or daughter ever calls you out, hey, why are you on that phone and not talking to me? Notice that. That is one that takes a lot of courage on the part of your child to call you out on that. And if they call you out 
and you acknowledge it and you say, listen, I'm sorry, I really want to apologize for that, you are more important, that's great. But if you don't acknowledge it, they're gonna see that and they're not gonna ask again. And that will do some pretty significant damage to your relationship with your child and that will be a father wound that you are inflicting on that kiddo by not acknowledging that and they will now know, gosh, I had the courage once, I'm just gonna leave it this time and I'm gonna go play on my own. That's heartbreaking to me. I never want to have that happen. And anytime I am confronted by that by my kids, I do my best to acknowledge it, stop what I'm doing and appreciate them. So it's a really good point. Because their son wants to please nobody more than their dad. There's yeah. no, no coach, yeah. no teacher, no mom. It's like, I want dad's approval. I want dad to like me. And I want dad to be excited about what I'm doing. And when dad um, takes that influence and flushes it down the toilet, it takes 10 coaches to replace him. And what are those coaches teaching them and what values do they have that they're inculcating in your kid that you don't have and you don't want your child to have, especially when we're talking about public school and the things that they might or might not want to be pushing on your child. Be there for your kid. Don't allow those coaches, don't allow those teachers to take the role that you have been placed here on earth to provide. Here's, here's what I would tell every dad listening. Every dad can be the dad they wish they had. That's great. Everyone. Yeah. yeah. Everyone. There's no victims. You can be a remarkable rock star dad. I mean, how true can that be, right? We have the capability to take the wounds, good or bad, that we've gotten from our father, take those, translate them, and one up and be a better father by simply just acknowledging where we sit, where we wanna go, the cultural values that we have and that we espouse, and doing the work. You have a child now, do the work, so that you can help to have a better life for them as you move forward. Having children is one of the most beautiful things in the world. I could not be happier to have it. The responsibility of having those three kids weighs on me every single day. It's such an amount of work that I know that I can't fail at. So being that better father is something that I'm working on every single day, and that's the whole point of this channel. If you're getting good um, information or thoughts out of this, give me a subscribe. There's lots of great information, lots of other videos that you'll be able to see. Would love for you to continue with me. Let's finish this up, I think it's almost over. If a dad wants to break generational curses, and if he wants to prevent himself from wounding his son unintentionally, be open with your son. That's son, I, like that. I know I'm not perfect, and here's the deal. If I make a mistake, my, my commitment to you is I'm gonna own it. That's good. Because I'm, I'm not a perfect man, but I'm following the perfect man, Jesus Christ. That's and good. I'm endeavoring to be more like him. And when I fall short, I'm willing to admit it because my identity isn't being perfect. Yeah. My identity is, 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 is being found in being a loved and adopted child of God. So when you're receiving the love of the Father, you have love to give as a father. That's great. Yeah. Wow, so profound. Apologizing to your kiddos when you mess up, it can be humbling. It's very humbling for me when I do it, and I try to do it as much as I can when I do mess up. But it's amazing how much they will forgive you, no matter how much you screwed up during the day, whatever it is, if you come to them and say, listen, remember when I yelled at your mom or I rolled my eyes at your mom earlier today? That wasn't the right thing to do. I apologized to her, but more importantly, I'm apologizing to you. You shouldn't see me, your dad, treating your mother that way. So I apologize and I'm working to be better. I'm working to be a man of Jesus and I'm learning from Jesus. You're going to church. I'm taking all three of my kiddos to church. Even though they're in Sunday school, they're learning a little bit of that too. So that kind of comes back full circle, right? The wounds that I have, the wounds that I might inflict on my kids can be washed away by simply acknowledging it, apologizing to your son, apologizing to your daughter, letting them know that you are human and you're working to be better and you'll be all the better for it. Thank you for joining me on this today. I know this was a bit of a longer video. I hope it was beneficial to you. Check out John Lovell. That man has so much wisdom and knowledge to give. Here's another video right here. If you're interested, you can watch this. I got lots of great content. Subscribe if you would like. Give me a like on the video too. I hope you're well. Come back for another video. Talk to you soon. Thanks.